Welcome back. We continue shining the spotlight on the country's ailing water infrastructure. Last month's report by Blue Drop Watch found that the quality of our drinking water has deteriorated due to defective and ignored infrastructure. My next guest is Gundo Maswime, lecturer at the University of Cape Town's Civil Engineering Department. He's been studying the challenges faced by municipalities across the country. He joins me now from Mutale in Limpopo. Uh, Mr. Maswime, thank you so much uh, for your time this evening. Can you tell us first off how the distribution of water infrastructure has changed over the last 100 years in South Africa? Yes, thank you. When um, South Africa became a union in 1910, uh, three years later, the first water legislation was passed. And if you read that uh, piece of legislation, it was called the Water and Irrig Irrigation Act. Uh, what that meant was water was seen as something for uh, farming uh, or for agriculture, for irrigation. Then later in 1948, a new government came in. It took them eight years, and in 1956, we had a second water legislation in the country. That is where the mining uh, complex and the industrial complex had, all, had now started taking root. So it was a contest between agriculture and mining. It was only in 1999 that the 1994 project changed uh, the use of water to focus on the consumers or the households, so they became the main uh, consumers. So that was locked even in the constitution. That became a basic right for all uh, households. Uh, but now the, that, uh, as noble as that sounded, it also came with some uh, uh, consequences because when the industrial complex was in charge, they financed water projects, they sat on water boards, they were interested in knowing what is happening with the water situation. But as soon as 1999 uh, Water Act came, they seem to have all pulled back and left government to run everything by itself. Mm. That also has unintended consequences for agriculture in the sense that they are now sort of left out of the loop in terms of water policy making. What's been the impact? Yes, the impact of that is you have got um, a situation where uh, when agriculture was in charge, if you look at settlement patterns, people used to live where water was uh, next to water bodies, and that is where agriculture and farming was happening. So right now people are trying to live wherever they can live in the hope that water can still be supplied. Uh, but now uh, water, uh, the the... Uh, the special distribution of water has been following uh, where agriculture is happening. Uh, now, when people move away from those places, uh, less and less water is left for agricultural purposes. And in many instances, uh, if the government cannot supply water to uh, farmers, uh, there's, they, there's very little that they can uh, do uh, themselves. Uh, so that has had a very uh, negative impact on agriculture. And from time to time, we see new uh, uh, regulations coming in to try and uh, assist in the situation. But uh, agriculture has taken a knock from the, uh, the new legislation. Mm -hmm. In terms of spatial planning and that how, how that influences accessibility of water and the maintenance of water infrastructure, uh, talk to us about the availability of engineers and scientists in far-flung or more remote communities where access to water is still you know, a basic service. It's a critical human need, yet you know, it, it seems to be falling behind. Yes, though we can uh, safely say that South Africa has got the highest number of engineers that it has ever had in its history. We can also say that we probably have now the lowest percentage of engineers working in government. So the majority of engineers prefer working for the private sector, and a small amount works for the state, but they prefer to work in the cities. So if you find them in local government, you'll find them uh, in the city of Cape Town, Etequini, city of Johannesburg. In fact, um, city of uh, Etequini municipality uh, in Durban has got more engineers than uh, the Eastern Cape and Limpopo combined, uh, two provinces combined, because those are mo mostly rural uh, provinces. So you start to see the impact of that on the maintenance of water infrastructure in the more uh, rural uh, municipalities because engineers don't prefer to work there. In fact, 
120 uh, municipalities, at least out of the 257 in the country, do not have engineers that are employed. So you can imagine the maintenance of water infrastructure is a very technical um, competency, which is uh, within the ambit of civil engineering training. So if you don't have civil engineers in the municipality, then that, is, that becomes a big challenge. Talk to us about dams and water storage capacity needed for sufficient and sustainable access to water resources. The the uh, capacity or the storage of water uh, in any country, the idea is that you must have as much storage capacity as possible. It should not be based solely on consumption patterns. Uh, because as we can see, we have got erratic weather patterns these days uh, because of global uh, warming and climate change. So the the onus is on uh, the country to build uh, as much storage capacity as possible. And when you look at our pattern, the largest uh, uh, 20 dams uh, in the country were built uh, out of the 20 largest dams in the country, um, at least uh, 16 of them were built between 1956 and 1976. And the reason for that was that the previous government had noticed that that is going to become a challenge. And from 1948, they sent so many students uh, across the world, and even in South Africa, to study civil engineering, uh, especially at PhD level. There were at least 300 uh, a program where at least 300 uh, Afghan students were sent across the world to study civil engineering. And they came back around 1955, 54. And by 1956, if you look at uh, most of the highways that were built, they were built around that time, you will find that at least one of those students who were sent overseas was in charge. Some became uh, director generals within uh, the Department of uh, Water and uh, Water Affairs then, uh, and they were responsible for spearheading the building of uh, large uh, dams, uh, such as uh, the Wop uh, Dam, such as Harip, which is the largest right now, and also the expansion of the Val Dam, uh, you know, just to mention a few examples. So that seems to have been a government program that stretched until 1976, when government budget was now directed to uh, uh, to security and policy after the 1976 uprising. And even from a maintenance point of view, maintenance started lacking from 1976. Uh, and until uh, um, uh, now, we have got a lot of water infrastructure underground that has not been maintained since. Thank you so much uh, for your valuable insights. Uh, that was Gundo Maswema, lecturer at uh, UCT Civil Engineering Department, talking to us a little bit about uh, water infrastructure as we focus uh, on that issue this evening.